I am Julie Livingston. I'm back for another edition of PR Patter, my semi-weekly show here on LinkedIn Live, that where I talk to the amazing people from across my marketing and public relations network. Um, I am thrilled today to welcome Keith Reynolds. Um, he is pres founder and president of Publio, and he's an inbound marketing consultant, writer, digital media producer, and photographer. He founded Publio to help clients transition from traditional marketing toward an ROI-based content publishing model to promote brands, build audiences, grow a sales pipeline, and optimize SEO performance to generate qualified leads. <laughs> Keith is also an author. He's written The New Content Culture, Think Like a Publisher to Grow Your Business, and his company is Pot is the HubSpot solutions provider focusing on connecting your podcast to your CRM. So welcome, Keith. It's great to see you here today. Thank you, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. So why don't we just take a step back uh, for a moment, Keith, and tell us a little bit about your background and how you formed Publio and why? Sure. So I started my career... <clears throat> Uh, I was very fortunate to join IBM. I started out in the field, having put on concerts and events in college, doing computer fairs. And I was IBM's first collegiate rep going onto college campuses and teaching people, huh. this is a computer, this is a spreadsheet. And you can take a, a chart from your spreadsheet and put it into your Word document. It was right at the beginning of the PC revolution. And we looked at every campus as a closed loop marketing system and we had advertising and fairs and all kinds of things. And that experience uh, led me to the internet and I wrote my first website in 94 and I started um, doing blogging and following HubSpot. And one day with a startup in the uh, mid 2000s, early aughts, uh, I, I did a blog because in the financial crisis, we ran out of money. And little did I know that a few months later, I'd be asked to testify to Congress. And I've been trying to chase down wow. that chain of events. How do you do that? And the idea of the closed loop system and blogging, um, and today it's podcasting. So I talk about connect your podcast to your CRM, right? If you enter your go to market with uh, that framework, then even if you don't pick up every bit of attribution, what you can work on is improvement. And I've transferred this then to work with companies like Kodak and Vodafone and um, other startups. And in 2017, I wrote my book um, to try and capture this experience and share it with people because I, I really got very unique training at a very at a young age and have been able to put this into practice in my whole You career. were really in it from the beginning. From the beginning, tech, uh, digital marketing for us was was debugging the laser printer and doing desktop publishing when we started. <laughs> wow! So tell us a little bit. I mean, you're so creative and really are. I've been so impressed at how you kind of follow trends. Tell me a little bit about um, the what you call the content hub and the podcast ecosystem and why it's how you created it um, and why it's valuable to marketers. Sure. So, I mean, think of having a channel, right? We're all moving into this world where our company has to have a, a 24 seven uh, online presence. We don't want to work 24 seven, but we want to be online 24 seven. So having a, a, a framework around what we call a content hub and, uh, and I'm even starting to call it more of a channel because we use podcasting now. Uh, it's different than blogging and download my white paper, right? We've come a long way in the last 15 yeah. years. And uh, so a content hub is a blog, basically, but it's multimedia. It has news from your company. It's what people um, need to know to do business with you and what you want them to know to understand your brand and your values. And so that, you, rather than calling it blog and resources, Give it a name. You know, one of the biggest projects I ever worked on was chief packaging officer for Kodak. And by the time we were done, we had doubled the size of the database uh, that we had to market to. 
And when Kodak sold the division, they actually got a premium on the M&A deal to sell the content property. And it was a content hub. And today, a content, I'm sorry, a podcast ecosystem, think of it as a chapter or an episode on that content hub. And so we're using podcasting today to generate content. This interview that we're going to have can be chopped up into pieces and you can write a blog. Ah, so it's not it. just one and done. It's not one and done. In fact, kind of back to the early days of PR when I got when I got started, um, it wasn't about the placement in a publication. It was what you do about it afterwards. And so today we can put it on our blog and get really focused SEO. And if we have a guest and they link to us, we get a backlink. And then we share that blog on our social media and that creates cookie trails back to us. Well, this is based on the way the internet is designed. It's a series of hub and spokes that connect to each other. And Google became Google because they recognized that fact and said, that's relevance, that's authority, that's trust if people I, link to each other. You know, that is so visual for me. The, 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 it's sort of like a wheel. Yeah. And the spokes in the wheel are are the how you're leveraging the content on different it's platforms exactly. in different yeah, ways. I, yeah, I love that uh, that analogy and and how that connects with you. That's wonderful. Um, so when people are starting a podcast, what are the things they should think about first in terms of the content and how they might repurpose it uh, and edit it so that they can get the most mileage? Sure. Um, so generally, if your podcast is part of this content hub, then think of it in terms of chapters uh, or, or themes that you would cover. So a news magazine, what do they do? You might interview your CEO about the direction of the company this year or this quarter. Uh, you might do how-to videos, you might do, or discussions. Um, you can have uh, customer stories, interview your customers and your channel partners. Uh, we were just written up in MarTech for uh, how this is a great tool for promoting uh, your partners and your partners promoting you. Um, so you have these themes, and then the next thing is to put together a calendar. And... Um, because we're working in a world where we're online 24 seven, right? So it's a, it's a process approach. And then we need to produce content on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis. It's a batch approach. So you kind of have to mesh the gears a little bit to make it work. And a calendar is the point at which it all comes together. Um, that's that's the last, great. The last thing I'd say is have an ROI model. Like, what are you trying to do? Um, and, and this gets back to connecting it to your CRM. So when you're podcasting and you're live, look at who the guests are and follow up with them. Uh, if you're in a larger organization, have your sales or marketing department observe and get that information into your CRM and follow up. But what's the value of a lead to your business, right? You wanna be able to speak to your CEO about why we're doing this. And many times when you do the analysis and you can download an ROI calculator on my website, many times when you do this, you find out that two or three sales can pay for the entire program and the rest is gravy, right? And so it's really a, a great medium because not only are you building value for your company, you're promoting the ideas right from the thought leaders who have customer facing responsibilities in your company and you're promoting your partners and customers uh, as well. So if you can do that and generate a lead and and pay for the program with just a couple sales or a handful of sales, then this is a no brainer. Um, and we'll get into the kind of the value of time in a little bit, I, I understand. Yeah, and tell me a, a little bit about how the partners uh, generally speaking, of course, you can't talk about all your partners, but how do they feel about this kind of a model? Um, because sometimes partners want to be kept under the radar. You know, the, the whole point of a content strategy is to really make it work for everyone's objectives. And when we sit down and we start to design the the content hub and the and the 
the podcast ecosystems, it's what are our goals, right? Who's your audience and what are we trying to accomplish? And so if that doesn't fit a partner model, um, then find another partner or find another strategy. Maybe it's your employees that tell the story the best. Um, now, you don't, you know, in the old days, it was, oh my gosh, I have to write a blog and you'd assign it and it would never get done, right? If you put it on a calendar and you make somebody responsible for it and you have an ROI uh, outcome that you're all shooting for, this is a campaign about how to grow your business. And so it requires executive support. They have to be behind it. Um, and they should be able to invite the partners and people that they go to market with onto the podcast to tell the story. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think you're right. I mean, look, it's not always that easy to replace a partner, but you know, I think it's something that you want to discuss with them at, at the onset to see if you can both work together to create this, this very rich content that you can uh, use to promote both of your, both of your businesses. You know, uh, I'll take this back to when we first started writing websites. It was who you are, who we are, what we do, uh, buy my stuff and my links page. And this idea of working with partners is like having a rich links page on, on just a fundamental website. It, it was how, again, these linkages that the, of the way the Internet is designed. Now, um, you know, I am very involved in creating thought leadership content on LinkedIn to raise executive visibility. And I wanted to ask you about your thoughts around thought leadership mm -hmm. and why it is so critical and how, how your technique of building this ecosystem can help propel that forward. Sure. Look, thought people buy from leaders. Everybody loves a winner, right? And that is how you have to project yourself. And podcasting is just another way to do this. Um, the reason thought leadership is valuable is that uh, it, it saves you time in terms of getting people to understand what you offer. It saves you money in terms of the amount of promotion that you have to do. If you have a reputation that precedes you, you don't have to spend, spend money to get the recognition, right? And then lastly, right in the sales uh, cycle, um, you want to have something that you're known for. It's faster. It takes. It, it has a, a, a lower total cost of, of ownership. Something like that that's easy for people, and those are just simple ones. But when people are sitting around a boardroom table or the kitchen table and making a decision, thought leadership can help you isolate down to that one thing that they can make a decision on. Oh, we're choosing this one because. And that, if you don't have it, your competitors will define it for you. So, you know, it's lead, follower, get out of the way and, uh, you know, prefer to lead and define ourselves when people are, you know, because you can't be in the room when the decision's made. So th this kind of material, both in the original interviews and then how you chop it up and share it. I mean, imagine sharing the, the key message in a video by email, right? So that that can be shared within a client's account. That's, I love that. Um, and Keith, I'm just so impressed by your breadth of knowledge. How, how did you, like, did you have mentors in your career who, you know, really um, helped you develop this interest? I, I did. And you hit the nail earlier. I'm creative, but I'm also a geek. And I, I have a rare combination of those two. But the, you know, the mentors for me were when I joined IBM, uh, after two years in the field, I went to headquarters and I was working with, you know, I was 29 years old and working with people in their 60s and 50s um, about how to run large scale corporate campaigns. And um, for me, it was thrilling and exciting. And then a few years later, I, I was on my own. I started a dot com and I worked uh, half time for a fellow named Bob Yeager up in Westport, Connecticut. And he sat out on a river, uh, watched the water go, and he wrote um, case studies and and white papers. And I got to write those kinds of really thought leadership things. And he turned me into a writer uh, over those five years. And so I really, and, and the interesting thing in the connection is, while I was working for him, we went from always pitching editors to place our stories uh, and case studies were, 
you know, in, in manufacturing systems magazine kind of thing. They were eight pages long. They were, you know, 3,000. Wow. Words, oh, my God. Index, right. Wow. And we'd send along a white paper to the editor to say, not only do we have a yeah. customer, but we have some thought leading ideas for your article. Um, but we started publishing, our clients started putting the content on their website. And then editors would say, well, I don't want it because it's already out there. So you really had in the late 90s and early 2000s, this schism about what do you do with your content? And then around 2007, 2008, I started following HubSpot. And after the financial debacle, my, my, basically my, our startup said to me, you, uh, your marketing budget is there's your office and your laptop, <laughs> go figure it out. <laughs> and, you know, from traveling around the country and yeah. being a funded startup to that and the blog attracted just the exact person. And I really want to make this, um, point the value is not in the 4 billion people on the internet. When you do these interviews and you chop them up and you share them, your audience might be 500 people, right? So write this. Right. To the you, you, can ne you can really niche it down. You would niche it down. Now you throw it out there into the 4 billion people, but now that's when you start looking at various technologies and partners to deliver your message exactly where you need it. And if you're doing well, uh, doing it well, the people who receive it find it valuable, right? And absolutely, and they, they could go to your contact us page. So, uh, having this closed loop system approach, and and designing it from the beginning, I see a lot of companies say, "Oh, we can't do attribution and blah blah." blah. It's not about the exact measurement; it's about continuous improvement, right? So we use concepts. Uh, I, I've developed a methodology. There's seven steps to create a, a content strategy, North Star idea, editorial strategy and calendar, publishing and promotion to the channels where your customers are. Could you be your trade association? Uh, the community and events. How does your content translate down sure. to a trade show? The marketing automation, the training of your salespeople and the ROI model to go talk to management. Those are the seven principles of coming up with a strategy but then you have to implement it. And back to this idea of being online uh, 24 seven, but, but working in batch because we work five days a week. Um, you, you want to have the, the teamwork working off this calendar. And so it really, you know, there's, there's programs like EOS, um, the, the entrepreneurial operating system, the Rockefeller principles, the E-Myth, um, all of these concepts are around teamwork and process, people, process, and technology. And we're in this world where you have to be creative and come up with the story and deliver the messaging, but you also have to be technical in your delivery and distribution. Right. One of my one of my other follow up questions are: um, this sounds this could be this could sound overwhelming to somebody um, to come to a company, an organization that wants to really blow up their podcasting content, but isn't really sure how you've laid out, you know, a system that you've developed this ecosystem that can help to do that. But it sounds really time consuming. So mm. talk about that a little bit and the efficiencies of this model. So uh, when you hire a service like ours, and I, we're building the um, podcasting help desk, right? It's it we really want this to be a white glove service. So uh, you don't have to think about it. Uh, there's the writing of the questions up front. There's the decision of who's going to do the interviews. But at the end of the day, you done well, the executives that participate spend a couple hours to generate a month's worth of content. And because it's out of their mouths, it's going to be on strategy. And then you can have the team internally, at, or you can have our company Publio do it. And our job as consultants is not to be an agency and do everything for you. We want to make sure that your team is able to do as much as possible in house so that this is affordable, but it right. comes down to skills. And as little time as possible. And as little time as possible. So again, it's, you know, a couple hours of input and a month's worth of content that's on, on strategy. Um, thanks. That's, that's really, uh, 
that really helps a lot. I think to take some of the pressure off, like, oh my God, how am I going to do all this? Oh, you know, when we started uh, it with video, the first, you know, putting la uh, video on laptops, for example, we take a crew of executives to an editing suite and there'd be food. And it was like the green room at a rock and roll yeah, show. Yeah. Right. And now it's, I sit in my third bedroom or at the co-working space and we're doing video. So it's come a long way. It's amazing. So I've, you know, we've all been reading about the changes in privacy. Um, and how, how might this, or how is this affecting the world of podcasting? So well, why, maybe you can give us a little bit of uh, background on um, the, the current changes in privacy. Sure. Well, I remember receiving my first letter from a, I know exactly where I was, from a Nigerian prince who wanted to borrow my checking account so he could transfer some funds. <laughs> I think we've all gotten one of those, right? All right. So the internet, when we first started, was not, not taxed. There was all kinds of incentives to try and get online and everybody rushed in and it, you know, there were a lot of benefits, but there was a lot of problems like that. A lot of scams, the anonymity and scale uh, make it very dangerous if you don't protect yourself. Um, well, now we're getting into a realm 30 years later where we really have to have a much higher level of security. There's national security implications. Or what, you know, look at what's going on with TikTok. Um, the the internet is closing down, and so email, for example, is um, going to be managed by you as a sender. If you're tagged as a spammer, or you have non delivery non delivery emails because you have a crummy list, then your emails are going to not be delivered. And their goal is to make email as private as your cell phone, right? You don't get spam on your cell phone. Why should you get it in your email? And right. the choke point are the marketers. So we really cannot be spamming and we have to maintain our lists, which means we have to have an audience that appreciates us and wants our content. And so podcasting is a way to generate valuable content that people want. Um, additionally, I, I uh, don't have any statistics, but... Uh, you know, you, you look at the way SEO works and it's around delivering a great experience for the person who searches. Google will also throttle crummy content. So we're being we're out of this environment of great experience and, and increasing privacy and security where you have to have an audience. You can't just buy a list and, and send it out and spam um, because you'll not have your email delivered and no traffic to your website. No. So this, you know, think like a publisher to grow your business. Publishers created an audience. They sold events. They got advertisers and they knew the value of their audience. Today, we can do the same thing based on the value of a lead, right? If I have a thousand people visit my site and five people buy, I can do the math. How many leads do I need to make my numbers, right? So if all of our media is focused on that and we're looking at it from a position of thought leadership and influence and going to market and building an audience, um, we're just not selling the advertising, but we're doing everything that a publisher has done since Ben Franklin invented the advertising model 300 years ago. What do you think are some of the misconceptions about podcasting? I've noticed that a lot of people are really afraid to get in front of the camera. Um, I will tell you, uh, I've I started out kind of the back of the house guy, and over the last ten years, I've been working on my public speaking, and it it takes effort and practice. But you know, any career coach will tell you today you have to have a video presence. But that's a big inhibitor. I think people are afraid of it, and that's why I love the interview format because I didn't memorize anything. I know my stuff. And right, if you're sure. running a business, you know your stuff. So, sure. right, jump online. Absolutely. With Julie. Uh, Mark J. Carter is another great guy. I've been so thrilled to work with him. Um, he's a professional interviewer. Um, he makes me look good, right? I want to work on distribution and and getting the content hub and being the you know the managing editor. Where it, you know it's invite talent in and really get people to fill the voids and you use their creative talent and don't be afraid. Get online. 
the first time I was ever on video, the producer came up to me and said, son, you look really, this is, I was pretty young. You look really nervous. Just <laughs> smile. The camera appreciates the smile. Oh yeah. Smile and eye contact. And eye contact. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that it can even be fixed in post-production. Now there's a little button you push after we record this and it says correct for eye contact and our, I'll be looking at you the oh whole time. God. It's unbelievable what you can yeah. do now. Well, Keith, this has been just such an enriching conversation. Thank you so much for joining me, but how can people get in touch with you? What's the best way? Uh, so, you know, we're here on LinkedIn live and you can look up my company, uh, Publio, P U B L I O on LinkedIn. The URL is streaming down below in the ticker here. Uh, at uh, publi.io. Uh, and on my website, we have uh, a fully functional inbound marketing content site. I, I actually spent my PPP money on building this. And it's a, it's a working example. And so you can do things like download a white paper, get an ROI calculator, great. and register, and you can uh, get on my calendar. That's terrific. That's great. Well, Keith, thanks so much again. And if you are looking to elevate your thought leadership on LinkedIn and in the media, we should talk. Go to my website at wantleverage.com to download my free tip sheet, Make Your C-Suite Stand Out on LinkedIn. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time on PR Power.